Now, this is very interesting right here that Paul said right here, he persecuted who? The church of God. Now, there's a heretical doctrine called hyper-dispensationalism. Yeah. Hyper-dispensationalism, they teach right here that the body of Jesus Christ, a.k.a. the church, did not start until the Apostle Paul. Uh, I don't know if I'm out of bounds, but just let me know, okay? But hyper-dispensationalism, they teach right here that the body of Christ, the church, did not start until the Apostle Paul. So look at this right here. We believe this. It's after Jesus Christ died on the cross, okay? And then there's like a transitional era right here as well. But within this transitional era, the church age started right here from the cross, see? So, but the hyper-dispensationalists don't believe that. Sometime in the middle, they'll believe it. Why? It was sometime in the middle of Paul's ministry. Because hyper-dispensationalists, they try to confuse people of them being dispensationalists. So be careful out there what you're watching out there. How you can tell who is a hyper-dispensationalist is if they start to use the word grace in their church. They're known as the grace church. You'll see that quite often. Now, don't get me wrong. There's a church like Grace Baptist Church. If it's a Baptist, you're most likely in the right, okay? But if it's like uh, Grace Church, Grace Community Church, Grace something church, and they emphasize Paul, then that's like a red flag, okay? But the biggest key is when they confess their mid-acts, then you know they're hyper-dispensationalists. If they say they're mid-acts, then they're hyper-dispensationalists. That's their favorite key phrase. So watch out for them. Watch out for them. A lot of them know who I am online already because I teach a lot of dispensationalism. And then they'll try to get on me on weird teachings, deep doctrines. Because their only deep doctrine is dispensationalism. They don't know all the other deep doctrines of God. People think that dispensationalists are only onto dispensationalism. No, the reason why we get into dispensationalism is because we're interested in getting all the doctrines of God milt and uh, meat and even the really crazy ones and the really practical ones and the ones that make you uncomfortable, unpopular, make you lose people. This, uh, I know my job, my duty, and I'm not going to let you down on that. I have not compromised for the past 10 years. I'm not going to let you down again on that. All right, so I'm going to teach you all the doctrines, okay? All right, the only time I limit myself, as you may have noticed throughout the years, I only limit if it uh, does not edify the brethren, all right? And I've done that. And some of you know... <laughs> the ridiculousness where I had to limit myself. And you're like, it's okay with me. But, you know, I'm glad it's okay with you guys in my church because you're here, you know me. But people online, they don't know me from Adam. So, okay. Anyways, aside from that fact, so you got to watch out for these guys. These people believe that uh, it started because they believe dispensationalism like we do. They believe about, you know, Paul's gospel, right? Paul's the one that revealed it. So it would make sense to them that the body of Christ started with Paul. That's what they're saying. But this is the main problem with mid-acts. They don't realize there's a transition. When you think transition, it is true. Paul didn't give his gospel clearly until his time, but you got to realize this. Within a transitional era, there was like a back and forth stage. Transitional means this. Transitional means it's not the end of Old Testament and we just jump to church. It's back and forth right here. It's back and forth right here with Jew and Gentile. When you have transition in mind, it will be incredibly eye-opening to, to nearly all right doctrines in dispensationalism. Trust me. You know how we, the reason why people accuse us for the doctrines we teach is because we hold on to transitions. Transitions is key. This is what anti-dispensationalists don't believe in as well as uh, hyper-dispensationalists. Transitions make the key with everything. Okay, so there's this back and forth stage. They don't realize that. So it's true. Paul's gospel wasn't clear until him, but they got to realize this, that before him there was a church and there was a back and forth with Jew and Gentile. So uh, let's look at several verses right here. Let's look at uh, Ephesians chapter 2, right? Ephesians chapter 2. Keep your hand at Galatians 1, though. Keep your hand at Galatians 1. And uh, let's go to Ephesians chapter 2. Now, this is quite surprising to me. I, uh, I'm very surprised how much I have in my head uh, and the Lord's giving to me while I'm teaching this. I didn't intend this to be exhaustive, but it's just surprising how much I actually know about this. So let's go to Ephesians chapter 2. The Lord's leading. That's it. It's the Lord's leading. So Ephesians chapter 2. And then uh, we'll read verse... 
12, because this will be good to nail the hyper-dispensationalists. That at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off, are made nigh by the blood of Christ. Amen. For he is our peace, who hath made both one. So look at this. He's talking about Jew and Gentile, right? He's making them both one. He's making both of them one. It's not like Jew, Jew, Jew until the middle of Paul's ministry. No, God realized that there's a transition where they're going from Jew to Gentile. And if you're an honest Bible reader, you can't deny that. There was a transition from Jerusalem spreading out to Gentiles. Doesn't this make sense now with dispensationalism? And I didn't even go exhaust mode right here. All right, I'm just telling you everything from, from my piggy bank over here, okay? So why am I keep stressing that? I'm stressing this to point out that that's why it's common sense and you have to be realized, if you're an honest person, there is such a thing as dispensationalism and dispensational salvation, yeah. see? Okay, that's why I'm trying to stress that, emphasize that. Okay, but anyways, so there's this back and forth here. For he is our peace who hath made both one, Jew and Gentile, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. Well, there's a, th a thing right here called blah, blah, blah. No, look at verse 15. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances. Ah, the Old Testament. For to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace, and that he might reconcile both Jew and Gentile, right? Jew and Gentile, yes? Yeah. All right. Unto God in one what? Body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. See that? So the church started right here, whether you like it or not. The church started right here. And Paul persecuted who? The church of God that time. Whether you like it or not, it started right here. But if you look at the book of Acts, you know, there were some Jewish Old Testament things. Oh, come on, come on, come on. Church age, right? And Jew, right? What's going on here? Yes, okay, transition. Please? Did you get that? Okay, there's a back and forth here. There's a back and forth. Okay, so, we'll, uh, so God started the church at, uh, at the cross, but you got to realize this. It became more solidified and cleared until Paul. And then after that, we know for a fact this is the church and there is no Jewish transition here. See that? That's why it makes sense about the Jewish signs and wonders, why it was available after Jesus died on the cross. Because the Jews were still there. There's that transition. Transition is so important. It's so important to recognize that. That's why it makes sense God gave up the city of Jerusalem when? At, when Jesus died on the cross? No, he actually gave up the city uh, and they lost their nation. That proved that he was not using the Jews under their ordinances that time. He was done with them at the first century. Why? Because he's giving them a chance after chance. He gave a public display that I'm giving you up at the cross and then with the apostles, he was ministering to them first because he was giving them a chance flat out rejected it, see? Okay, now uh, let's go back to uh, Galatians. Let's go back to Galatians, please. Isn't dispensationalism making everything more eye-opening now? See, this should be, make more sense now. Okay, so uh, let's go to Galatians chapter 1, and then we'll read verse 14. And profited in the Jews' religion above many my equals in mine own nation. See that? Paul, he totally understands the Jewish background. So he knows everything that went, they went through. He said, I profited it. In other words, he did really well in Judaism, Old Testament, above many my equals. Wow, so he was even better than all the Sadducees, Pharisees, and the higher-ups that time. His equals. He was better than all of them. In mine own nation. In his own nation. Israel being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my fathers. Paul was more zealous than any of them in the traditions of his forefathers in Judaism. So when people try to bash the apostle Paul that he's trying to get something out of it and start his own religion, here's something that doesn't make sense to me. He was the most fervent in his own religion. Why would he give all of that up? You know what, who's the hardest people to convert to Christianity? One of the hardest people is actually a Jew, and especially an atheist Jew at that. Now, take, take this to account. If you have a skeptic and a Jew combined, you're not going to convince him 
about giving up all that to go to Christianity like that and go through beatings and tortures. So this shows the Apostle Paul is genuine. So when people, you got to watch out for these stuff online when the liberal scholars try to make out Paul like, oh, he's some rebel trying to start his own thing. And the atheists try to condemn Paul for that. And then all these other people who hate dispensationalism and want to be bound by the Old Testament, they attack the Apostle Paul. Yeah. These people, they don't know Paul. They never met Paul. Who are they to say that? Amen. Paul from his own writing and his own life, and that's the evidence of the churches around him and the people who were scared of Paul, Christians scared of Paul because he persecuted them. Paul is the evidence he's the real deal. Think about it. Why do you think God would use Paul then for church age doctrine today for dispensationalism? Why would he use that? Because he knew that 2,000 years later, some loser on YouTube is going to say, the Apostle Paul was a heretic. You know that some loser in Harvard University at Divinity School will say, the Apostle Paul was a... See that? So you got to watch out for those guys. How about that? Okay, let's keep reading right here. So we know that Paul, he's a genuine deal. Verse 15, but when it pleased God... Ah, remember all the way back here at verse 10... Paul was saying, am I trying to please men or please God? No, he's talking about right here, verse 15, this please God. Because remember, back at uh, verse 11 through 12, Paul was arguing right here, you know, uh, 11, 12, 13, 14, what's the whole point of this? He's pointing out right here, it doesn't make sense why I would tell you this gospel, which all you Jews are afraid of because this is like all so new to you. doesn't make sense. So that's why he's trying to uh, give him, uh, trying to justify himself here. He's trying to give a good argument right here. So he's pointing out right here, if I wanted to please men, then I wouldn't teach this kind of stuff because I was a Jew of the Jews. If I wanted to please myself you know, or trying to convince that I'm pleasing God, then I wouldn't have done all this. He realizes it's because, no, it's because that pleases God. God wants that out of me, so I have no choice. I have to do it. So Paul explains what happened. What convinced Paul that this was that what he did please God. Why did he teach uh, the New Testament gospel and all that? 1 Corinthians 15, my gospel. Why? Because, let's keep reading. Verse 15, but when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb. So God separated Paul from his mother's womb. He had him born. Next part, and called me by his grace. So God called Paul by his own grace and Paul got saved. To do what? Verse 16, to reveal his son in me. So God revealed Jesus Christ to him. That I might preach him among the heathen. So Paul's preaching to the Gentiles. So all of the mystery about the church age, you know, he was preaching about that to the Gentiles. Immediately, I conferred not with flesh and blood. That's evidence that what Paul had was between him and God, not from somebody else he borrowed. Because he didn't borrow this from anybody else. If he did borrow it from everybody else, anybody else, why did the Jews hate him? So it shows right here this is definitely between him and God. 